episode number 10. As they say, Bobby, this is a milestone. That's right. Episode 10. And we're still not on iTunes. Hey, man, you know what? We're trying our best out there, folks. But, you know, the downloads are still coming in thanks to DyingScene.com. Click and listen. You'll find the links. Who needs iTunes? Who needs iTunes? We need iTunes, Bob. We need some iTunes in our life, man. I hope we get it resolved relatively quickly. Anyway. Anyway. I'm so exhausted, Bob. Dude, this week I, I moved. Yeah. And uh, yeah, I'm drunk and exhausted, brother. I know I the admit. I know the move's been coming on for a long time, man. How far did you have to move? Not too far, just to the next town. They ran you out of town, Bobby. They did. Damn it. Well, good stuff, man. Well, you know, drinking and all that moving, you've got to be exhausted, man. So I think you know the best thing we can do is you know I got a bunch of brand new punk rock that came out this week and. We'll talk about the news, play some music, and fucking get hyped up, dude. Wake up, motherfucker! Yeah, you're right, Bob. Let's fucking do that. Let's get crazy, man. But isn't there somebody you'd like to mention first? Oh, I was getting around to that, Bobby. Fatenzo.com. Oh, uh, man, they're a silly little custom t-shirt website out there offering some simple design labs. But you know what the truth is? They don't really work. They get you to invest your time, and in the end, the design often looks shabby and amateur. They got this creative services team. They swoop in, they save the day, whatever. Fat Enzo, they ain't no gimmicks, man. Our designers, professionally trained illustrators and graphic artists. No clip art, no cheesy bullshit. If you're in the market for a logo or t-shirt or design, we offer a flat fee. Depending on how complex the job is, man, just give us a call. Let's talk about it. 866-970-9997. Or send us that old email, man. That's all you got to do, man. Fatenzo.com. Our expert artists are always at your disposal. Wow, Bob. That was great copy reading. You are an excellent radio host. Uh, <laughs> most professional. Yeah, I have absolutely no training. I am a hack, as some people Bob, might I, add. When was the first time you wanted to get into radio and stuff? Do you, um, do you remember the time? Sure, man. I mean, I was a kid. My dad used to be one of them AM radio hot jocks. So I used to go and watch him in the radio studio. That just burned a memory in my head. Parents split. Dude, are you serious? Yeah. I was, was a- I was like four years old. That was probably, oh, I don't even want to date myself, dude, but it was when AM radio was popular. I'm, that's all I'm going to say. That was pre-FM. That was when FM used to play like album sides. You don't know nothing about that, dude. Much too young. But if you want to know, man, that was the uh, the seed that planted it. And then uh, did some stuff. I want to say out of college, but I wasn't really in college. I just delivered pizzas there. But uh, worked for this, you know, pirate radio station and did that for a while. And then got in some trouble with the FCC. And, you know, so, I'm not allowed so- to talk on the FM waves anymore. So now I just stick to the Internet because it's greasy and dirty. And I can be whoever I want to be over here. You know what I mean? Bob, that's so interesting to know that you're the seed of this guy who implanted radio. Yeah, I'll say, yeah. Radio personality, man, you were injected with. And just like another seed I want to talk about, uh, I want to talk <laughs> about our homeboy, Bill Manspeaker, his seed. Oh, yeah. And, oh, uh, dude, yeah. I heard about yeah. that this week, man. That's, you uh, heard about this, right? Let's talk about it, man. What's going on? Well, listen, if you like Bill Manspeaker and you like what he's about, you'll know that he's not a satanic cult leader, right? I right. mean, I know that. Sure. So if everybody knows that, let's help them. Let's keep the Manspeaker family together. Bill Manspeaker, founder and creative mind behind Green Jello, is an entertainer, a musician, a storyteller, and most importantly, a loving father. He is currently embattled in a court proceeding, attempting to remove his custody rights to his daughter. As court systems generally are, they are oh, unsympathetic to hardworking people and are requiring a retainer of no less than $5,000 to protect his human right to be a devoted parent. Bill has brought so much laughter and joy to everyone's life. It is a shame that red tape may keep his daughter from a loving and devoted father. Please give what you can to assist Bill. He gives so much to everyone else. Let's see if we can help him out in his time of need. Bill's got to go fund me. You can go find the info on his Facebook page. As a matter of fact, we'll post it on our Facebook page. And while you're over there, why don't you click a like, too, won't you? So we'll put the link up there. He's almost at his goal, Bobby. He's asking for $5,000. Last I checked, he was over $4,000 in just over, not even 24 hours, something like that. The story is, is he's being accused of being a, uh, a de- what is it, a alien, uh, a demonic alien god or something. He jokes, he jests, he's on the internet, he makes fun, right? So he has a small child. Someone has made a claim against the man, and the state of California has picked up some charges, and uh, that now they... They want to take his baby. The KKK wants to take his baby away. 
essentially is what it boils down to, Bobby. But on top of that, this was after the most epic weekend that Green Jello had, man. Listen, they were up in Philadelphia, and their fans in full pig garb, you know, these big heads that they wear at the, at the shows, destroyed the place. Absolutely crushed it in Philadelphia, bro. Done. They destroyed it. They have a great run of shows up there in the New England states, and he opts to play back to California, and that's what he gets greeting him is uh, paperwork from the state of California saying that was going to happen. And yes, destroyed. When I say destroyed, Bobby, that was news in itself. Bob, the only thing I'm going to say to this really quick is uh, all, I did get the Facebook notification that they were in town. Friday they played uh, Long Island or something like that, and then Saturday they must have played Philly, and that's when that happened or whatever. Long Island's kind of far from you, isn't it? No, we're, we're separated by the Long Island Sound. Yeah, I and know, could, but... so I, I could take a ferry across. By car, it's far as fuck, though, isn't it? Because you have to go through all that traffic. I sat in traffic for two hours in New York, Bobby, and fuck that shit. <laughs> Check it out, man. I got some brand new stuff right here from a band out of right here in Tampa, Florida. Featured on DyingScene.com, man. Moral Decline. These guys are fucking badass. They're good friends of mine. Remember last week I talked about a uh, song called Habitual Line Crosser? And you had called me that I was a habitual... What would you call me? Habitual... Something along yeah, those I lines. Called, I called you uh, a habitual line crosser. Yeah. Something <laughs> like that. And uh, I said, yeah, that's too bad I didn't have that song in the playlist. Well... That was the first one I picked on the playlist this week, mainly because it's uh, brand new. Just came out, man. Uh, just this week it did on uh, their own record label, which is called Get Loud, or Get Fucking Loud, as uh, some like to call it. So anyway, here it is. This is Habitual Line Crosser on Dying Scene Radio. Get my fix. I don't really give a shit. There's a rubber at a 
What's up? This is Justin Thirst from Chaos Delivery Machine, and you're listening to Dying Scene Radio on DyingScene.com. That was a band called Knockin' Bones, and that track was called Warriors. You like that stuff from Rancid, the old Outcome the Wolf stuff, the punk meets rock and roll? Well, it's been compared to that. They're a three-piece, and uh, they're out of Austin, Texas. What do you guys think, man? Why don't you send us an email, man, or a tweet? I'm at the Bobby Pickles, and I'm at Bob Noxious. Anyway, the band formed out of Austin it was formed by the Baseline Bums, Mark Allen, and uh, they got a brand new EP called Save My Soul. Available for free download. Check it out on DyingScene.com. I checked that out on DyingScene.com earlier this week, Bob. That's a really good song, man. You like it? Yeah, dude. Uh, skate punk, bro. It brings it down to basics. It really gets your blood boiling and makes you want to kill people. And that's <laughs> what I'm all about. That's the whiskey talking. Yeah, dude. Listen, the whiskey's talking. There's a contest I want everybody to know about on behalf of DyingScene.com. And there's an incredible prize pack from the legendary California pop punk band, Sweet Baby. Wait, they what? Really Hold on. Sweet Bay? Isn't that a grocery store? Sweet Baby. They're uh, releasing a reissue of their 7-inch It's a Girl, and it's limited to 500 copies. And then there's a bonus 7-inch limited to 250 copies, test pressings of the LP and the 7-inch, and the reproduction 1989 tour t-shirt. Out of print on vinyl since 1989. It's a Girl is widely considered the first East Bay pop punk record. A very limited 500 copies, 250 bonus 7 inches repressing is up for pre-order right now at www.eccentricpop.com. Formed in Berkeley, California in 1986, Sweet Baby and their contemporaries Operation Ivy, Crimp Trine, the, the Mr. T Experience, etc., played a seminal role in the earliest days of the Gilman Street punk scene. Many credit Sweet Baby with inventing an entirely new genre of music. 
one which melds the harmonic pop sensibilities of the Beatles and the Everly Brothers with the frenetic four on the floor song structures of the Ramones and the Buzzcocks. It's a genre that came to be called pop punk, and it's a genre that Sweet Baby defined and perfected years before anyone else. What the fuck, Bob? What do you know about this band? Nothing, huh? Interesting. Like I said, I thought they were a grocery store. But I'm not from California, uh, so you know what? They may be the best thing since sliced bread over there. Deli bread. Dude, there's a video up on um, DyingScene.com. Last week, we talked about Fat Mike's Punk Rock Musical Part 1. This week, Part 2 was up. Hey, so I don't have to watch it. What's this one about? Actually, Fat Mike says this, quote, unquote. I actually wrote this out verbatim. Matt Skiba is one of our best friends, and he was perfect for the part, but now he's not in the show anymore because the one thing we didn't take into account was him being a live actor. You gotta get it right every time. He wasn't used to that. It's not like the movies, where you get 15 takes at it. He could have nailed that, but Blink-182 called him, so now he's in Blink-182. That's basically what I got out of uh, number two. Awesome. You know, Blink 182 has been in the headlines, man. They, like I said just now, you know, Bobby, they gave, uh, Matt please, no 182 knows. Uh, <laughs> yeah, but listen, everybody talks about it, man. It's pop punk. It's popular. If punk. they quit talking about it, we could quit talking about it. Not pop anything sucks. Pop country sucks. Pop punk sucks. Pop uh, fucking hip hop sucks. Every fucking kind of pop anything sucks. And everything else is awesome. If you listen to old school country, man, that fucking outlaw, like Towns Van Zant or Graham Parsons, uh, what Willie about your Nelson, Waylon Jennings and your uh, oh, those shit. guys are fucking awesome, and that's almost like punk rock, man. If you listen to some of that shit, bro. Anyway, this week, Blink One Two, they did their first concert with Matt Skiba, and they're talking about doing a record together, and they're loving it. And also, Matt Skiba as well, him and The Secrets, they also announced that they're going to come up with an upcoming album. So apparently, Matt Skiba can't act, but he can sure as hell be in a whole shitload of bands and play music. All right, so go fuck yourself, Bob. Oh, I mean, I love you, Bob. Let's go just play some music. Quite honestly, all this talk about Matt Skiba bores me. I'd rather play some music from a TV and ska punk band called Band Mango. These guys are horn-infused. They got a brand new EP. They just put it out. It's called Young, Broken, Happy. They're streaming the entire thing right here on DyingScene.com. Dying Scene Radio! Whoa! And this track is Sinking <laughs> Ships. Bad Mango!
Vlag the Ripper representing the dwarves, and you're tuned to the sounds of Dying Scene Radio. Dying Scene Radio. Black Dahlia. Rock legend in the place to be. <laughs> this is the place to be. Orlando, Florida. Bob Noxious. Dying Scene Radio, man. You are under the weather and getting ready to hit the stage, man. How much like shit do you feel? I feel as shitty as you look, my friend, but I want to get out there and fucking be a legend, as I always do. Deliver the goods to the people, man. That's how we do. <laughs> Listen, man, good luck, first of all, for the show tonight, man. What Are you, are you taking any kind of medicine? You, have you been to a doctor? I took a bunch of cocaine in Puerto Rico. That was my uh, therapeutic cure. My co-host, Bobby Pickles, he... Um, interviews no, see, you no, you're already going beyond the one question i was promised here i'm getting to now it we're talking about some obscure dude from new york <laughs> he uh interviews you a week ago for dying scene radio he got kicked out of the show as you guys are playing he swears that you got him kicked out i did <laughs> how, how does that work I did an interview with a guy. I, I don't think I would have kicked him out. I never kicked anybody out of anything. I kicked the shit out of some people. But Honestly, I think he's got a paranoid complex, and that's really what it really boils down to. Yeah. I had him talked into it, though. And so we're still talking about him in my interview. Is that right? Let's wrap this up. Let's what wrap you, this what, up. What do you have to say? Gentleman Blag. Rock legend. Seven inch, man. Fucking seven inch. Blag, die you blag. Friday. We have taken care of the fucking one question that I asked you, man. All so, right. Blag. Thank you so much, man, for being part of Dying Scene Radio, you man. Got it. You're the man. Rock on. beg you to stay Joe you're singing some 50 songs man where did you grow up and what did you uh, listen to when you were growing up New Hampshire I grew up and I listened to like the 60s stuff Turtles Beach Boys some Rolling doo-wop. Stones yeah I didn't listen to that stuff so much but uh, my older sisters had like a really good record collection so I would listen to a lot of that stuff from the late 50s and then my sister Heather's a few years older than me and so I got into a lot of really cool rock and roll stuff so it was uh, I listened to all that stuff but really poppy stuff is what I, I love Turtles and Del Shannon and the Beach Boys and all sorts of shit that's what I really like 
growing up in New Hampshire and listening to uh, the surf style music, you know, it's influenced your playing in the queers. Yeah. 1981 you guys started, right? Yeah, that's when we first did our first 7-inch anyway. So, you know, in the time that's between then and now, I mean, what's that, 30-something years? Yeah. How has the punk rock music scene changed for you, and how has it evolved? I mean, what do you notice that's different between 81 and, and now? I wasn't really that involved in, like, the whole big punk scene. I'd go to shows back then, and we just kind of did it as we put out 207 inches as kind of like just to have a little local thing, you know. Gigi Allen was around, and so he inspired us to do the 7 inches and stuff. You know, I jammed with him a fair amount back then. We're, he was a drummer, so he drummed for me. Probably money, you know, became more commercial and accepted, you know, when bands like Green Day got bigger and shit, you know, so uh, it changed. It was a lot more underground, minor threat and black flag and social D and all that shit. But um, in some ways it hasn't changed that much either. I mean, the, the music got a little more professional, the whole thing. So I agree with you, production, you know, and everybody, yeah. you know, having Pro Tools in their studio these days, yeah. of course. But, you know, I mean, in the time that's happened, you know, I mean, it seems like um, punk rock, it went through its phase of where it was not really accepted to where there was like a little bit of interest and there was mass appeal. And I feel kind of these days it's kind of coming back into where it's, you know, it's kind of where it belongs. It's in clubs. Yeah. The, the beauty of punk rock, I think, Joe, is that you can just kind of get together. You know, if I was interviewing Aerosmith right now, I couldn't be talking to Steve Perry, but you make yourself quite available. And that's the beauty of punk rock. You know, everybody's yeah. accessible. For me, like, when I would go see big rock shows, like at the Boston Garden, you know, it was all arena shit, you know? And I saw right. some great shows, but you could never talk to any of the musicians. And then I started going to the Rat Skeller in Boston, which was their version of CB's. And, you know, the band was there, and you could go talk to David Minahan from the neighborhoods of John Felice from The Real Kids, who had played with Jonathan Richmond and the Modern Lovers at one point, you know? And uh, I think they were from Situate Mass or something together. And um, it was really cool. It was a new thing that you could fucking talk to the... Uh, Joe, man, that's far out. I love you, man. Oh. You've been partying since day one, man. That's Joe right, Queer. Man. man, we used to shoot heroin, me and that Black Dahlia. Speedballs, motherfucker. Speedballs. But, uh, yeah, you could talk to the musicians, and it was so cool, and there was no, like, barrier. Those bands talked to you, across to you, directly, not down at you like the rock stars would. You right, know? exactly. And so it was really, really an eye-opener. It was such a cool thing for me, like, back then to see that. And um, I kind of never forgot that, and so I really frowned down on a lot of these punk bands. You know, they, they kind of start off as punk bands, and then they turn, using it as a stepping stone, and then they turn into, like, wanker, blowhard rock stars. <laughs> And it's just like not my thing at all. Like we turned down the Warp Tour. We turned down opening up for like bands like Social D, No Effects, Bad Religion, all those main support. And I was like, no, I'm not trying to make it in the business. I just feel like a blowhard trying to make it in the business. I'm not trying to make it in the business. I'm a guy who grew up in the Social D and Dead Kennedys and Black Flag and that's who I am now to this day, you know, so I just couldn't so do that. So you like the old school hardcore stuff, you know, the... Uh, yeah, I loved all that, minor, you know, Minus Threat, all that shit, I love that. But that's an interesting question, you know, Warp Tour these days has become kind of a joke in itself. Yeah, but I agree. But it's really, I mean, you know, as we get older, you and I, and everybody else matures, yeah. you know, I guess music styles change and whatnot, but I've been listening to the Queers for a long time. I'm yeah. a big fan. It's a pleasure yeah. to meet you. It seems like you guys could really get a big fan base if you did the Warp Tour thing and kind of recycle the fans and, you know, get the kids, the children of people who are listening to you 20 years ago, 30 years ago, back in the day in New England? You know, we probably could, but again, I'm not trying to make it in the business, so, and I'm too lazy to do that, but I mean, I, we could, but I feel like too much of a whore to do that. I really do. I'm the same guy who grew up on the Dead Kennedys, and it's like Black Flag, and like, that really made a, an impact on me, so I just feel like a blowhard doing that and going out and trying to whore my ass to go make it in the business and I'm like you know what this is like success here this I never thought it would be this amazing that I could do an interview with someone in fucking Orlando and like it was a packed house and Richie Ramone's band even opened up and like oh my god you know and the dwarves and it's like this is all gravy for me man it's all gravy you know I never wanted to be like Green Day and, and you know I'm so happy for those guys but I didn't I didn't no, care about any of that shit. I completely quite understand where you're coming yeah. from, Joe. And you speak of legends, you know, Richie Ramone, you know, part of the Ramones legacy sure. and whatnot, playing here tonight with you. What's one of the crowning moments in your musical career to where you've got to rub elbows and share a bill with one of your absolute heroes? Probably with the Ramones when um, one of the big times was when um, 
I had sent, this is way, way back, I had sent Joey Ramon a cassette tape. We would always get backstage at the Ramon shows. So Joey gave me his address and I sent him a cassette tape of four of our songs, the queers. Goodbye California, love, love, love. I don't want to get involved with you and I'll be true to you. Stuff that would be on our Grow Up album. I sent him the tape and a month or two later I bullshitted my way backstage at the University of New Hampshire. I got backstage and I said, hey, there was Joey. And I went up. They never had big security there. You could always get backstage right, even before yeah. the shows. So I went up and I said, hey, Joey, I'm Joe from the Queers. You know, we weren't like best friends or anything. And he goes, immediately, dude, I really like Goodbye California and Love, Love, Love. He goes, fucking, I'd love to cover Love, Love, Love. That's a great song and the vocal phrasing. And it made such an impact on me that I knew he had listened to the songs because I just said, it's Joe from the Queers. And I knew, and he came up and said, I think Goodbye California and Love, Love, Love are great songs. And I was like, Fucking man, my I was just like, wow. Joey Ramone said my songs were good, and I know he listened to them because I didn't say, how do you like those songs? He immediately said, I like them, and I was like, whoa, man. And then another time was when I was talking to Joey. I kind of became friends with him, at least enough that we talked quite a bit on the phone, and he'd come to our shows and stuff. And he asked me to work on his solo album, and he said, I really need better songs. I've got some good songs and people will blow smoke up my ass and say it's great and blah 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 but I, I know I need better stronger songs I can come up with stronger stuff you want to work on some songs with me and I was like Jesus man fucking Joey Ramone asked me to work on songs wow and those were two of the times right there that really like man oh man and then like about a week later Joey actually called me and played me two songs uh, what a wonderful world and Maria Bartiromo, before his solo album, long before it came out, he said, I got these two songs done, listen to him, and he held the phone up to the speaker. And I was like, man, this is fucking cool shit, dude. You know, long before it came out, and then I go, man, he goes, what do you think? I go, dude, this is great. And true story, he wanted to cover Love, Love, Love. Johnny didn't want to do it. And they had the song Slug. This is probably around 86, long before Slug ever came out. Joey sent us a cassette tape with Slug on it. We even talked to their lawyer, a woman lawyer from New York, about them using our song. I don't know which album. It would have been something that I believe Richie would have drummed on. I can't remember what album it was. So he sent us the cassette tape of Slug. At that time, there was no unreleased Ramon songs. We all knew every fucking song that came right. out. We're like, listen to that song, Slug. Well, the cassette tape plays, and we're just sitting there going, this is a cool song. Keeps playing. And then we hear Joey, it's on a cassette tape where he had recorded part of a song that he was working on called I Want to Be Happy. So it was just the chorus, I want to be happy, I don't want to be bad, I want to be happy, I don't want to be bad, I don't, yeah. So I never forgot that little snippet, I want to be happy. And then like his phone rang, he started talking on the phone, it was pretty funny. I told him about this years later, he goes, you're kidding me. I said, dude, your phone rang, you started talking about Marky and shit, we couldn't believe it. But... He asked me to work on a song, and I said, geez, you got that song, I want to be happy. He goes, oh, my God, I remember working on that song. I said it was on that tape of Slug that you sent us years ago. Because I forgot all about it. <laughs> ben Weasel and I took that verse, and I said, let's finish a song for Joey's solo album, and let's finish I Want to Be Happy. We took about 10 or 15 minutes, and we sat down with that one little verse that Joey had, and me and Ben finished that song. We wrote the bridge and we wrote the whole thing, the guitar lead. And that was for Joey's solo album. By the time I talked to him, he was in the hospital and he ended up never coming out and he died. And we wrote the song for a solo album, I Want to Be Happy. It's on our Pleasant Screams album. But that's a true story. That was written for Joey's solo album. And it would have been such a great song for his album. And so it really sucked that he never got to sing it. But that's a true story that, in a roundabout way, me and Ben Weasel wrote a song with Joey Ramone. So that's pretty cool, you know? And Absolutely. it's a killer tune. Did you, did, you, did, did you get the blow and all that stuff and the I gun? Got, I got the, the cocaine, the gun, and the money. Lloyd, take care of it, bro. I, when I ring the bell, they switch places. It's fucking great, dude. Hey, Black. Great Lord, show tonight, hey, man. Lord, what are you doing? Are you I'm, I'm going to go sanitize myself oh, after okay. I shake You're your hand. Flying? Right on. Dying scene in the place to be. No. Anyway, yeah, hey. So that was like a really cool thing. So I was like, you know what? We wrote a song for a solo album. So, you know, that shit was really important to me. And I did mention that to Joey's mom after he had died.
track right there was the Queers classic song, I Can't Stop Farting. I Can't Stop Farting. Came out off the 1993 record, Love Songs for the Retarded. It's badass stuff, man. Had a great time at the Dwarves show, man. I miss the Adam Age, though, Bobby. I know that uh, you had talked about how great they were. I did talk to them, and they were down with doing an interview. It got late, and all the interviews that I did were late, and it was loud when I met those guys, and I didn't get to connect, but I'm sure we can get together with those guys again soon, man, but... Absolutely. Bob, was it a big venue where you went? If they had put two more people in there, then it would have probably been sold out. And I would say that there was probably about um, maybe 200 and something people there, two to 300 in that range. I think three might be a little generous, but there was a bunch of people that were there. Here's the funny thing. The concert ended at 1150 sharp. They escorted everybody out of the building. We went, got some pizza after the show, walked back past the venue, they had reopened as an entirely different vibe. It was like a DJ hip-hop club, and there was a line wrapped around the building to get inside. And I thought, wow, that's money right there, man. Have a sold-out show with the Dwarves and the Queers, or near sold-out, cash in there, kick them out at midnight, and then bring in the Ravers. Listen, what did Black say about me, and that scumbag? He fucking talking shit about me, huh? <laughs> well... You know what, Bobby? I, I, my favorite part was when he said he'd kick your ass as opposed to kick you out, man. So, <laughs> yeah, or something along those lines, you know. So, yeah, you know, it's all good. Black was sick as fuck, and I, I'm surprised that I didn't get sick, man. I thought this thing was going to incubate, and I was going to be sick as hell doing this recording right now that we're doing for the show. But uh, all was well. Black was sick as fuck, though. I think maybe you gave it to him, man. Maybe you gave him that cooties. No, nah, man, I didn't. I, I, I haven't been sick for, uh, for, well, I can't say years, but definitely half a year. I'm good, man. I'm relatively healthy. And uh, no, I didn't give him any sickness. But uh, hey, maybe he caught it at the last stop in between New York and Florida. I That's probably he where he caught it. Yeah, he was coming down through uh, you know, the East Coast, or probably around the Carolinas or somewhere around there. He probably picked up some... Diseased toe yeah, bag. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Probably gave yeah, him a blowjob yeah. and some herpes and uh, you know, the, the influenza. <laughs> Listen, he had me kicked out of there. I, I, I swear to God, uh, he who cannot be named. Why does he not play on? Okay, the so he who was not there. Uh, he doesn't tour, man. He only does big shows. He uh, lives there in San Francisco. He's still very much a part of what the band. What is he a prima donna? No, he's very much a part of the band, and it's nothing about being a prima donna. It's about paying your bills and taking care of your family. So he has an actual career that pays his bills, and think of it this way. Remember that movie Office Space? He, yeah. he He's like that guy. He, you know, not any one guy character, and definitely not the stapler guy, but he's just the guy that works in the office. He clocks in every day. He clocks out. He gets 20 days of PTO a year, roughly. And, uh, you know, he saves it for the big shows. Punk rock bowling, maybe a warp tour date on the West Coast. Who knows? Mm -hmm. but that's how it is. Basically, the dwarves that you and I saw was the Black Project. A bunch of guys playing with Black. Great cool, band, man. though. Hey, Great hey, band. Hey, yo, Black was uh, he was good. Um, uh, he was good and full of himself. He's uh, no, <laughs> he, no, no, he, no. I was gonna say he was a good sport. Black was a good sport in the whole thing. Listen, hey, we both got to interview him. For the show. It's funny, right? Absolutely, it's, man. Well, we talked about having the, the first and second part, and that's how it ended up. So there you go, man. That's right. Well, hey, how about some news, Bob? Last week, we reported that Bad Religion had already started writing new material for the next album. In a recent interview, guitarist Brian Baker stated that he hopes the band will be back in the studio recording the album, which will not only be their first since 2013's True North, but their first with Mike Dimkich, who replaced longtime guitarist Greg Hetson last year. Baker states Brett and Greg are writing and we're going to work this year, but hopefully we'll be able to record in the fall, which I'm excited about. Bad Religion last released Christmas songs on October 29, 2013 through Epitaph Records and uh, we'll be on tour this summer yada 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 Bob right. you had something against Epitaph didn't you? no I don't have anything against Epitaph man well first of all question is this you know the last relevant band that's left on Epitaph let's face it is a uh, bad religion I want to ask when are these guys going to start franchising their name out Instead of their old asses touring, how about we just get a franchise unit going two or three of them in the world, or four or five of them, or be like Green Jello does it. You just got a you know a local band who covers yourself while you do that. Epitaph Records, it's just not for me anymore, Bobby. 
I'm not into the emo kid bubblegum pop that they have. It's just not for me, man. It's a different then, label. It's not the label that you grew up with in the 90s. Hey, you probably won't like this next band that I'm going to talk about, Bob. The world is a beautiful place, and I am no longer afraid to die. I just thought that the name was interesting, but they just signed to that glorious record label we were just speaking about, Epitaph Records. They announced a few Northeastern tour dates with Spray Nerd and Makeshift Shelters, and you can view all the tour dates on DyingScene.com. The band's entering uh, Burlington, Connecticut studios this week to uh, start recording their sophomore full-length album, the follow-up to 2013's Whenever, If Ever. In the meantime, they'll be releasing a split 7-inch with Roswell Kid on uh, June 23rd via Broken World Media and a two-song 7-inch Death to New Year's on July 28th via Top Shelf Records. Well, that's anyway, kick-ass, Bobby. Let's play some more new stuff right here, man. This is some brand-new stuff from Frank Turner who's just released a new song called Get Better. It'll be appearing on his currently untitled sixth studio album, but you can listen to it right here, right now, right here on DyingScene.com, where we'll keep you posted on the details of his upcoming record and when it's coming out and all the goody goodies in between. His last record, Tape Deck Heart, was released in 2013 through Interscope. This track here is called Get Better. It's Dying Scene Radio. I got me a shovel and I'm digging a ditch This is Joe from the Queers. You're listening to Dying Scene Radio. Good my little back, so daughter's lunch and bust her as a man. Found time for soccer, starts a college fun of the age of three.
just a Portland, Oregon punk rock band called Fool's Gold. The track there called OCMD is streaming from their new album, We Have Clementines. You can check it out on DyingScene.com. The album was actually uh, co-released just a couple days ago, or actually last week, March 13th, on Bummer Dude Records and Pizza Shoe Records. I love the name of these labels, Bobby. They're always hilarious. They make me laugh. Bummer Dude Records and Pizza what? Pizza Shoe. Uh, pizza Shoe Records. Pizza Shoe. Yay, yeah, it's a Pizza Shoe Record. Anytime I it's, talk about pizza, I want to talk like I'm an Italian. I'm an idiot. Dude, Bob, have you ever heard of that band, Mast? Yeah, I've heard of Mast. Okay, because I've never heard of them. Tell yeah, me about them. Pop-punk band, uh, you know, turn of the century, uh, you know, maybe pre-turn, <laughs> like 90s. Sure. All right, man. They evidently got that together again. I think, I, dude, I wikied them. Because I didn't know anything about them. I said, Mest is a rock band originally from Illinois. The band's lineup prior to their breakup in 2006 consisted of... And then they give them the lowdown on who uh, was the lineup. Evidently, they got a different lineup together. And then, you know, they broke up at a certain point. They got a different lineup together. Then they got back together. I don't know where they are within their lineup things. But evidently, they've gotten back together with the original lineup now. So thank God for that, Bob. I don't know, Mest. But, uh, hey, I guess it's a big deal because, according to Google Analytics, uh, readers felt it was an interesting topic. Uh, you know one thing that I like? Less Than Jake announced more U.S.-Canada dates with Real Big Fish, man. I'm going to enjoy going to this. Bob, Less Than Jake, they're coming up to New York and the surrounding areas a whole lot. They're coming, man, like five times, man. The Paramount in Huntington, New York. Best Buy Theater in New York, New York. Twice on the 16th. Then they're going away, then they're coming back, and then they're doing it again on the 22nd. In between, they're going upstate Concert Hall and Clifton Park, and then they're going to do the College Street Music Hall in New Haven, Connecticut. And I'm going to go to that one, and I'm going to report on it, Bob, and I'm going to talk to these guys who are from Gainesville, just like, well, not just like me, but I went to that school, Bob, so you understand. I'll yeah, probably have name. Hey, I'll give you a little bit of trivia. I talked to Chris DeMakes, who is the, the singer for uh, Less Than Jake. It's been about a year you so did? ago. You did? I did, really? yeah, of course. But he lives here in Tampa, Bobby. Oh, man. The, well, yeah. I, it would be good to talk to him anyway up here. <laughs> well, yeah, you that's know? cool. No, yeah, talk to him. See what's going on, you know? Hey, sure a little, bit, a little to... bit from home, man. I'm from there. He's from there. Hey, what's yeah. up, man? I went to University of Florida. Did he go to University of Florida also, Bob? Yeah, they, he did. He, they uh, they went up there. A couple of the guys uh, went to college there at University of Florida. So uh, that's he He actually did, too? Um, he Honestly, Bobby, I can't recall. Get your facts straight, Bob. Hey, bro, you know what? I can't remember what I did last week, much less what I did last year, but I know he's from Gainesville, and uh, I know a lot of the guys went to school there at the Fine Institution of Learning, uh, University of Florida. Uh, I, don't, I don't know whether he did or not, uh, but I, I believe that he did. I want to say he did, but I cannot say without certainty. So you heard it here first. Bob has but, no uh, idea what he's talking about. Bob, it was very interesting to see that there are no dates in Florida. Boo-hoo, Bob. Even um, though he lives there, no dates in Florida. Listen, Bobby, they play down here eight times a year. We're okay. All right. Listen, there's also a live video of Bigwig performing Flavor Ice at Nate Fest. I guess it's in New Jersey. I don't is know that where like, Nate Fest is, actually. I guess I'm that, not. But Is that a 10-year-old video that you're reporting on? No, man. It's this. Dude, I, it's like a brand new video, and it's awesome, bro. They're fucking great. They're street punk. I love Big Wig. I would love to talk to them, Bob, somehow. They're up here in New Jersey. If somehow we can organize that, I would love to talk to them for Dying City Radio, man. So why don't you get in touch with them? All right, I'm going to, dude. Yeah, you're so pushy. I'd like to talk to Big Wig, man. Set it up. Let's do the old Oh, you want to? Oh, you want to. Oh. Well, I mean, you you said you were going to get in touch with them. I want to talk to them also. I got a couple questions for Big Wig. Bob, can you just come up here to New York and just... You know, you got to come up here during the summertime at some point. We got to set up some New York stuff at least once a year. Sure. You got to come up here and I got to go down there. Sure, absolutely, man. Uh, all right, last thing I want to talk about watch Scott Helland from Deep Wound and Outpatients. He gushes about his record collection. There's a little video he has up on dyingscene.com. He's the guitarist of those two bands I just mentioned. And he posts a video about his hardcore punk. Final collection. It's very interesting. One thing that caught my attention was that he talks about Minor Threat, the filler EP being like the best punk record. And I remember that record when I was growing up. My buddy Deke playing that shit. That one struck core me because uh, do you remember that that record, Bob? 
uh, you know, I, I found that record well after uh, you know it actually came out. So I, I can't say that I've been listening to punk that long. That's an old record, dude. Well, I found it whenever I found it. I mean, well, I I'm not as cool as you, Bobby. So that's you know something that you can hang your hat on. Hold on, when did that come out, Bob? I didn't find it back then. I didn't find it. When, when did it come out? Like 1984 or something like that. I didn't find it back then, Bob. I was listening. I found to it when I found it. I found it when I was like 14, 15 years old. Just like anybody finds things, you know. It was a great record, Bob. Anyway, there's an interesting video on DyingScene.com about this guy's record collection, and if you're interested in uh, learning about aspects of somebody else's record collection, their perspective on stuff, and punk rock and hardcore punk in particular, go to DyingScene.com. Bobby, let's play some more new music, man. Let's keep this show rolling, man. How about we cut out some of the times I said man, man? I'm going to leave all those, actually. You fucker. I got a band right here from Australia. They're called The Decline. I think that uh, we spoke about these guys a couple of uh, episodes back ago. They recently reformed, and they've got a brand new single out with the new lineup. It's titled Giving Up is the Gateway Drug. Now, the track is the studio debut of The Decline's newest members, Ben Elliott on guitar and vocals, as well as uh, some dude named Ray on bass. Follows the departure of some other dudes who don't play in the band anymore. Well, anyway, they've announced a short Australian tour, and you can check out the stream of Giving Up as a Gateway Drug, as well as their tour dates and locations on DyingScene.com. Here it is right here, The Decline on Dying Scene Radio. There you go. from Lancaster, Pennsylvania, motherfucker! You know what I listen to? What are you listening to, Maddie? I don't know, Omar. What are you listening to? I like to listen to Dying Scene Radio. I like Dying to listen Scene to Dying Radio. Scene Radio as well. Yeah. Stole a hundred bucks the other day No one noticed it was gone But I couldn't keep the guilt at bay 
Asked a friend for forgiveness, I just couldn't carry on. She said to me, You haven't lost your way. You'll be fine. You know what she did was wrong. Ran into God just yesterday He hadn't slept, needed a shave He asked me, boy, how did I get this way? Where's the beauty in this awful mess I've made? Punk sounds of uh, Drunken Logic. That's a band out of Philadelphia, Bobby. Pretty cool little video, man. I uh, found it interesting, and maybe that's why I included it. It captivated my attention and made me want to share it with you guys. So there you go. Oh, that's sweet, Bob. Thank you for sharing that with everybody. Man, that go was fuck some good yourself. punk rock. I want to thank this week's sponsor, FatEnzo.com. At Fat Enzo, just remember we don't do gimmicks. Our designers are professionally trained illustrators and graphic artists. No clip art, no cheesy bullshit hacky tacky artwork, just quality. The name goes on before the shirt wears out. It's FatEnzo.com. Bobo, if anybody wants to get in touch with you and complain about the t-shirt quality, they can uh, reach out to what? Bob Noggers at DyingScene.com? <laughs> Because I know yeah. you're getting your grubby paws greased by these guys or something, man. Uh, you got a sweatshop going in New York City. Whatever, man. I have a sweatshop down here in sweaty-ass Florida, which, by the way, Bobby, this is the first week we didn't talk about the weather. Uh, oh, yeah, that's 80, right. That's right, Bob. That's 84 degrees here today. Hot as balls. My car overheated in traffic today, Bobby. Pissed me off. Then, you want to know what made my day worse? I pulled over on the side of the road, decided... That I get gas. By the way, I think it's a thermostat. Uh, but anyway, I had to get gas, go to pop my old debit card in there into the machine, and it got declined. And uh, Oh, my God. Well, yeah. thank you for being so candid with us, Bob. Well, no, but here's what happened. Like two weeks ago, they sent me a brand new debit card, and I never activated it. Like a week ago, they sent me a letter and said, hey, man, you need to activate your debit card because we're going to cancel your debit card. Because I, I guess that my card was used in a place that a lot of cards got compromised. So they sent me a brand new card. So anyway, me, I just put it off and put it off and put it off, and I went to go get gas today. It's a good thing I had a couple bucks in my pocket. 
That was a good day to start out with. 84 degrees and hot. What about you, Bobby? It's still cold up there, ain't it? Bob, you took that car all the way to Orlando to uh, interview the queers. I did. Um, no, dude, it, so, there's nothing wrong. My car's a great car. I think it's just the thermostat got stuck. It overheated while I'm sitting in traffic. When I'm driving around, it drives perfect. As long as I don't sit for a couple minutes. So I'll get taken care of. It's a Honda. It'll run forever. So like I said, if anybody wants to talk to uh, Bobby over here about his car, give him some car facts or something like that. At Bob Noxious on Twitter and the same name, Instagram. If you want to talk to me, Bobby Pickles at Dynasty.com. Um, at the Bobby Pickles on Twitter, Instagram at Bobby Pickles. I actually got that name. There's not some scumbag sitting in his mother's basement. Is that the new basement uh, room down there? They built the basement out down there, man. Looks nice. You got a <laughs> bookshelf built in. There's nothing on oh, your bookshelf in your new place over there. Nothing on my bookshelf yet. Yeah, Bob. Uh, you can check out our photos on Instagram at Dying Scene Radio. And you can like us on Facebook.com slash Dying Scene Radio. And, of course, for full interviews, check out our Dying Scene Radio YouTube page, which we don't have a vanity name for as of yet, but eventually we will. And you can always call the hotline. Which is what, Bob? 347-754-PUNK. That's 347-754-7865. That's the number to dial. You want to call us when you're drunk. You want to call us when you're high. Call us when you got nothing better to do. God damn it. We just want to hear from you, man. Might even put you on the air. So, yeah, Bobby, my car made it to Orlando, and it'll make it up to New York and back, too. So that ain't no problem. But uh, it did make it to Orlando to the Queer Show this weekend, and I got part two of this Joe Queer interview. So let's run that on the way out, man, and we will see you guys next week for episode 11. Down here in the Sunshine State, I'm Bob Noxious. And up here in uh, the antithesis of the Sunshine State, I'm Bobby Pickles. And we'll see you guys next week. Backstage with the Ramones, talking to Richie years before, you know, he didn't know us. And Tulu, my bass player and drummer who just died. By the way, our condolences, man, with Dying Thanks, Scene Radio. Yeah. Tulu was our drummer, and he's talking to Richie about how to drum like a Ramon. And so Richie rode out. He's drinking beer with us. And it was backstage because Joey, Dee Dee, and Tommy, everybody would, I know, uh, Johnny, everybody would mob them backstage. So Richie was always available to talk. So he wrote out a list of how to drum like a Ramon for Tulu. <laughs> Richie forgot this, but we took that list that Richie wrote, and we had it on our rehearsal room wall for the longest time. I told Richie, and I go, oh, man, dude, you were our fucking god, man. But uh, it's pretty cool that I know Richie fairly well now. And That's a great so story. Like, Does Richie you know, remember that now these days? I mean, you played tonight with him. Does he remember that? He didn't remember it, no. He didn't. <laughs> he didn't. He remembered that we opened up at the Agora Ballroom, the Queers opened up, he remembered the shows, but not that we were the opening band. I'm sure it was all a blur, you know. It was a different yeah, of day and age. Yeah, sure. Yeah, there were big shows for him. It, it was just a dream come true to think, gee, uh, friends with Richie, you know, and, and Joey, and I got good friends. You know, it was really cool for me to talk to Joey on the phone, and they weren't that much older than me. I thought Richie's my age, I think, and uh, Joey was a little bit older, and Johnny and Marky, but, uh, you know, talk about the bands he liked, you know, and I said, you know, T-Rex and... Joey was really into that glam stuff, Slade right, yeah. and, and Mud. The old New, and York, uh, New York Dolls and stuff. Sweet right. and shit like right. that. Yeah, he loved that stuff. And, you know, we're talking about T-Rex, and he had never seen T-Rex. And I told him how I saw Ian Hunter and Mick Ronson do one solo tour that I had seen where they encored with Moon Age Daydream, and Joey didn't see that tour. And I was like, dude, he was, like, so jealous. I was like, oh, it was amazing. They came out, and they went into the jam on Moon Age Daydream for the encore, and Rono, Mick Ronson's playing the fucking guitar and then all of a sudden they you know I'm like going this is cool and then they go into Moon Age Daydream bah, I'm an alligator I'm a mama papa coming for you it yeah. was great to talking to Joey and then like we we're talking about the Trogs and he did see them when they were doing a club tour like in 78 and shit and how amazing they were dude isn't it great, man, how you have your idols? And there are kids these days that they look at you as an idol. Uh, and you maybe, know, yeah. <laughs> hey, it happens, bro. Trust yeah, me. well, yeah. You're well-respected in the punk rock community. Yeah. Let's but, just say but that. But anyway, you know, it was really cool for me to talk to Joey about that stuff. And you know the great thing about him? He was a fan. All of a sudden, I realized what got him out of bed in the morning wasn't how many drugs he had done or chicks or whatever. He just wanted to talk about another good song. He's like... I always wanted to talk music like, you know, he knew that song, The Shy, because he asked me, what did you think about Acid Eaters? What did you think? And I was like, oh, that song Circles by The Who would have been a really good one. And he goes, yeah, yeah, yeah. 
What songs didn't you like on that? So we would listen to fans, you know, and like wanted to see what I thought, you know, and like Circles by The Who would have been a good one. We Gotta Go by The Shy Guys, which was on one of these Pebbles reunions, a band that did like two songs and from Ohio. He knew them, you know, and it was like so cool. And But I realized what got him out of bed was just, you know, music. He was still so excited. My friend Jordan partied with her boyfriend and Keith Richards. She said that that was the same thing as with Joey. She goes, it was so cool to see how excited he was about music, Keith Richards. He had the guitar going, they were getting fucked up, and they were writing songs, and he was just so into it, man, you know? And, and Joey was the same way, and I go, oh, man, isn't that great, dude? You know, that's what gets those guys out of bed in the morning, and we all need something to get us out of bed in the morning, you know? For sure. That's what I say, and so um, it was really cool to get to know to him and see... That's what got his engines going. It wasn't about, oh, I'll meet these guys in these bands that suck and they have never done anything and they, they act like rock stars and they're pompous to their roadies and other people at shows. And these little piddly bands that like have never done anything and the Ramones changed the fucking world. And every last one of those motherfuckers, from Joey to Marky to whoever, the most down to earth motherfuckers, Richie's hanging around, they were all the same way. They were so into it, man. They were so into it. Didi had his little act on, but I never saw any of them be mean to anybody. And they were very down to earth. And Joey was just himself all the time, but he was a, a fan of music. And I was like, fucking, that's great. You know, I mean, I am too. It's still, I get excited by that shit. And I go, I guess I always will. But, um, you know, Joey was like, uh, we're talking about Brian Wilson and how Brian Wilson listened to Be My Baby. And he listened to it about a hundred times in a row. I go, the first seven inch I ever had my friends had and I had to listen to it. It was 16 tons by whoever did that song, Tennessee Ernie Ford. Uh, yeah. They had it when I was about 10 and I had to listen to it. And I still do that. I'll listen to like over and over and over and over. I just listen to these songs and I go like Hell in Love, Atomic Beat Boy or something. I just have to listen to it 50 times. And that's how Joey was with these songs. You know, he told me, you know, I was like, I just fucking had to go back and listen to Surfing USA about fucking, you know, a hundred times like this week. I don't know why, but I had to, and it was so great every time. Or uh, one song we talked about, it was Bobby Sherman. Julie, 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 do you love me? You know, I know that Julie, song. Julie, 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 do you care? Julie, 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 are you thinking of me? Julie, Julie, will you still be there? You know, we were talking about what a cool song that was. The Carpenters and how... Everybody dismisses those, but Joey and I were talking about how cool they were on like... On Dinah Shore and... Well, you know, the Carpenters, I thought like um, that one song, I said, maybe the Ramones could have done like, can we stop hurting each other, making each other cry. We talked about what maybe he could have covered and stuff, but he was a big fan and I go, they were such great pop songs, you know, and he really was a fan of them too. So it, it was pretty cool, you know, he... He just really was into another good song, you know, and I really loved that. It was a big lesson for me, yeah, you know. I go, wow. Sure. Instead of talking, see, I thought you started a band because you wanted to um, get laid. Or <laughs> we were so insecure, you wanted to act like we were, you know, more well, That's where it starts, but then you get integrity. Yeah, well, you know, you want to do drugs, uh, fucking hang out with chicks prettier than you should be hanging out with and do all that stuff and party and but then it turns into this thing where like you know music just gets in your soul and like for me it's like meeting people around the world you know I mean even at our little level man I've got friends from Shanghai to Boise man I can go to Japan Russia fucking you can't put a price tag on meeting these kids and having friends and acquaintances all around the world and I always wanted to do that when I was in high school it was a dream of mine to go to like the Coliseum in Italy, you know, and I got to do that. And I have friends in Italy and Spain and man, you know, I, I go, wow, I've traveled like a good part of the world. And gee, I, I've, I've got to do this stuff that I dreamt of when I was a young kid, you know, I wanted to be in a band and man, I did it, you know. And, and so that's where I put the value in this is not doing this stuff, you know, it's really good, but my ego... I'm 57 now, so I don't need any of that shit. Now I really put the value in, like, maybe I can help some fucking kid that's going through a tough time. Maybe, you know, I it just meet people in their every day-to-day -day lives, because at this level, we can do that. We're not the Rolling Stones. Yes, no. We'll sleep at people's houses, but you know. You, you have a voice, man, and you have a voice within the musical community, and you and, look great for your so, age, bro. Yeah, Holy thanks. shit. And uh, that's where I put the value in this stuff. I'm like, man, this journey, I don't know where it's going to end. I'll probably drop dead on stage sometime, but it's just like going down that next bend in the river. It's like when you get out of bed in the morning, 
I have plans for the next year. It's like you never know what's around the bend in the river with music, you know? It's like, I fucking, you know, I'm working on a book that's almost done, and then I'm doing another one, and then we're doing a new album, and it's just like, wow, What's the man. book about? What, what are you writing a book about? It's centered around the tour we did with Marky Ramon over in Europe, me and Dangerous Dave, who's not now, here Now, was tonight. that with Claire and Alex also? No, they had dropped off, and we took over on bass and guitar, and so the queers would open up, and then we would play with Marky. We'd jump on stage with Marky. But it was behind the scenes. It's this stuff here. Very little to do with Marky. Marky's kind of a boring person. I love him like a brother, but he's boring. <laughs> right. He figures very little into it. It's all about traveling with the roadies, the behind the scenes shit that you deal with day to day and how the tour operates. And that's the interesting stuff. It's not like, oh yeah, we played and there was a chick with big tits. And the, you know, it's nothing to do with that. You it's know? not the over glamorized thing that you would see on no, MTV2 it's, or it's, whatever. It's like the fucking assistant promoter fucking put the GPS in for Bolsano, Italy, and took us to a street called Bolsano Street in some little village six hours away from where Bolsano, the city is, you know, shit like that, and losing the envelope with the pay for Marky Ramon and the Queers, which was like about 6,500 euros, which at the time was about $8,000, at a festival in Gijon, Spain, and these people come up to me at like two in the morning, this couple that had seen us play, and they're like, Joe, we see this envelope here, 6,500 euros cash. And like we see this this envelope with your name on it, the queers of Mark Ramon. We think this is yours. Is this yours? And he hands it to us. Dude, there was fifteen thousand people wandering around drunk, and they found it in the middle of the crowd and what? gave it back to us. Holy shit! And that's shit. how close they were losing that money. But um, dude, it just goes on and on. It's and amazing on. how different cultures have different ideals and respects to like their fellow human being. You know? Those people certainly did. There weren't too many yeah. people there that what? night that would have turned that well, one back in. Choose any city USA. I mean, and, and you know, that, that would have been gone. Dude, and you know part. what? Choose almost anybody in the city of Gijon, Spain at that festival and that money would have been gone. They were fucking lucky, dude. Did you and give them a reward? Did you give him a couple hundred bucks? I didn't know what was in it. I didn't look in it. And I go, I took it aside and I, I didn't want to fucking like say this is money. You know, I was just like, oh, what are, oh, thanks. You know, maybe it's our contract. And I looked and I go, dude, Dave, look at this shit. D Doc, the assistant promoter, dropped it. And every day on that tour, shit like that happened. You Holy know? So, shit. Uh, man. Anyway, so that's what the book, and then it's stories about the queers through the years. That stuff figures in. And we jumped to maybe a different tour of the story, but it's centered around that. And it's coming out great, dude. It's almost done, and I'm like so psyched. It's gonna be like a killer book. It's gonna be fucking great, dude. Do you really have a publisher? Good. Do you have that lined up yet? My sister's a writer, Heather King, and she's on NPR and stuff. So she's gonna hook me up with her editor, hopefully. And so we're gonna send it there first and see what happens. Yeah. So I can find someone to put it out. But I'm hoping I could get on a bigger book label or whatever. Sure, hey, book Random book. House, that'd be nice, you know. Yeah, but absolutely. So. But anyway, um, are you all set? I don't mean to be rude, but we gotta no, drive no. up to Gainesville. Do you think I want to ask you one last quick question? Yeah. Chris Barrows did a show with you guys yeah. tonight, the last couple yes. of songs. You have a long history with him. Yeah, Chris, yeah. How, how'd it go, man? Chris was great. He fucking came up, slammed through uncouth. Uh, we did, uh, what, White Minority into Tulu as a wimp. Yeah, yeah, yeah. As a tribute to Tulu. And then uncouth, a song Chris wrote for our Beyond the Valley album. No, it went great, man. It was fun. And then Richie came up drunk and played the drums of Sheena's a punk rocker so fucking slow that I almost stopped and <laughs> said, you're playing this all fucked up, dude. But I didn't have the guts to turn around and tell him he's fucking up his own song. No shit, so no he shit. was so drunk. He's like, it went great, didn't it? I go, dude, I'm going to wake up in a cold sweat tonight going, man, it was too slow, bro. But everybody had a good time. So. It's great. But Joe yeah, Qu thanks for doing it, man. It Joe really Queer, is. Thank yep, you so thank much, you. man. Dying yep. Scene Radio. Cool. Appreciate it. Yeah, hey. thanks a lot. Dying.